Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Indigenous Peoples Day today. Some some of you uh, may have children at home, so <laughs> the public schools are closed in some parts of, of, of the state. Thank you so much for, for being here, and welcome to our third event of the academic year at the HRC in the series Meet VCU Authors. My name is Christina Stanch. I'm an Associate Professor of English and the Director of the Humanities Research Center. Just a quick reminder that all our faculty, uh, to our faculty, faculty that our uh, residential fellowship applications are due on November 1st, and you can find more information about that on our website. Also on our website, you can find information about current and, and future events and um, all sorts of good things, especially about our new um, humanities labs we are so proud of. We have five already on the website and then two more um, forthcoming. As many of you know, our Meet VC Author Series invites members of the Richmond community as well as colleagues and students from VCU and other universities to meet VCU authors as they talk about their publications and answer questions about their work. It is also a time for celebration as publications, books in particular, take a really long time <laughs> to complete and see print. Um, our virtual events tend to follow more or less similar format. After I introduce our guest today, uh, he will speak for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have uh, time for questions uh, from the audience. And in the meantime, you can post your questions either in the chat or in the Q&A um, function on your screen. Now onto the good part. Um, today's talk it celebrates the publication of Professor David Shields' book, The Rob Roy Kelly American Wood Type Collection, A History and Catalog by University of Texas Press in June, 2022. Um, as Jill Gage, um, who is a scholar um, and I think curator also at the Newberry Library, I know I met her many, many years ago and I had a long-term fellowship there. As she writes in her uh, introduction uh, or in her review of David's book, quote, in this encyclopedic book, David Shields provides um, invaluable thought-provoking discussions of wood type as a physical object along with the manufacture, marketing, use, and cataloging of it. In doing so, he opens new windows on, into 19th century print culture and its materiality. Shields frames the book with Rob Roy Kelly's lifelong project of acquiring and cataloging wood type, culminating in the landmark 1964 publication, American Wood Type, 1828 to 1900. This exploration of Kelly's career provides a compelling peek into the mid 20th century network of librarians and booksellers who were interested in the relatively new endeavor of collecting the history of printing. I'm delighted to introduce um, today's uh, speaker, Professor David Shields, who is, an, for many of you here, I know you know him probably fairly well. He's an associate professor of graphic design in the School of the Arts at VCU, where he also served as department chair between 12, 2012 and 2021. Um, David previously taught design at the University of Texas at Austin, where he also served as head of the design program and as design custodian for the Rob Roy Kelly American Wood type collection, as he told me earlier when I, I, I mentioned curator, right? So I, I understand there's a quite a big difference. Um, his typographic research practice consists of an interchange between making and writing research through textual sources and direct engagement with physical objects and artifacts of the production processes developed over the 19th century and their impact on visual culture. He earned his MFA um, uh, from the Cranbrook Academy. Academy of Art and the BFA in Graphic Design from Memphis State University. David, congratulations on the publications of this 400 page monograph, which you both uh, wrote and designed, right? And welcome to Meet VC Authors at the HRC. Great. Um, thank you so much. Um, Christina, thank you for this opportunity. I, I so appreciate it. Thank you for folks being here on uh, screen today on a, on a Monday that's gorgeous out. So thank you for doing that. Um, happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, before I switch over to the slides, I, I have visual prompts. So I wanted to like show the book first. It's it's a nice, nice chunk. Um, and then uh, as way of introduction, um, I also wanted to talk uh, about the collection. And so uh, wood type uh, is uh, P 
piece of wood uh, that's been carved so it can be printed. And it is different from uh, metal type. Uh, this is a giant piece of metal type um, in that uh, the scale and size is, is radically different. And so it provided for a whole uh, range of, of opportunities that weren't available um, to uh, regular printing um, and was developed in the 19th century. But I'll, I'll talk about that now. I'm gonna share my screen. There we go. So uh, this is about four hours of material. I'm gonna get it in 40 minutes. So here we go. Um, nope. So yes. So here's the book again, uh, flat. So you can see the front and the back. Um, but to start um, all of this, uh, I, I wanted to talk about uh, talk about the collection uh, that Kelly put together. I'll talk a little bit about Rob Roy Kelly himself, um, but also about uh, what caused all of this to happen, or why uh, why these uh, why these were important um, things to to look at in the twentieth century. So Darius Wells invented the tool that provided the opportunity to mass produce wood type. Um, he invented the router. Um, it is a tool that he did not patent, um, but today has its own aisle at the hardware store. So um, what I have found, it's not always a great idea to go into a hardware store and talk about wood type uh, and the router because the folks just have no idea what you're talking about. Um, but a whole aisle uh, from a typographic tool, I always get excited about here in the 21st century. So uh, Darius Wells invented the, the router, the little spinning bit that was uh, allowed uh, the carving away of material so that you would have a piece of uh, material sitting on a block of wood that was high enough to print, uh, put ink on, and then print on paper. Um, and that's that's basically uh, what uh, lets everything else happen. So uh, also what the 19th century looked like, it looked like this. Um, this is to scale. These are uh, young young men. Um, this was the 19th century, so there still weren't uh, viable uh, child labor laws. Um, this is to scale. So you're able to, with wood type, make really large uh, letters um, and thus really large uh, prints. And so here is an image from New York um, in about the mid 19, uh, 1860s um, showing uh, advertising material that was uh, wheat pasted um, to buildings and uh, a way of mass communication, early mass communication. Um, this is the visual material of the 19th century when we think about wood type and we think about uh, um, how things were communicated. Uh, this is what we tend to look at and think of. Um, Here's another detail. So large, uh, large material um, to print uh, the type, usually in a few colors, uh, so that it would be eye catching on the street, um, and typically within an urban context, um, or at least a, a public um, uh, outdoors context. Uh, so as you walked by, you could see the see the material. And wood type was great for that. Um, we needed wood type to be developed for these kinds of large processes uh, because with metal type, you could only make it so large. The, the material be, was heavy. Um, it was hard to work with at certain sizes um, and there was a, a precision that uh, began to fall apart um, over, over a few inches. Um, so wood was sort of the perfect material um, to, to revisit as a printing tool. Um, wood type was also important uh, for a big chunk of the 19, uh, 20th century as well. Um, here, a uh, uh, war protest poster um, that is held um, at the Library of Congress. Um, here, uh, for the newspaper, the Dewey defeats Truman would have been printed in wood type. Um, the, the large headlines up until the latter half of the 20th century, wood type was used um, for that process. Um, here at the sanitation workers uh, protest in uh, Memphis, Tennessee in 1968, all of those posters would have been printed with wood type. Uh, the I am and a man are two different uh, styles of letter forms to fit on the placard, uh, but all of those were printed uh, by a union shop in Memphis. So that's the that's sort of the visual um, culture uh, that I tend to look at the 19th and the 20th century. Rob Roy Kelly um, was the scholar um, that began to look into this history. Um, Kelly was uh, an important um, 
teacher first, a uh, graphic designer. Um, here's a timeline of his uh, teaching accomplishments. He started the first undergraduate graphic design program um, in 1955 in Minneapolis. Uh, from there, he moved on and started the second graphic public graphic design uh, program for undergraduates in 1964 at the Kansas City Institute of Art. Uh, by that point, uh, it became very much prevalent within the the discipline, uh, many more programs were then starting uh, graphic design programs. So Kelly is important for that reason alone, uh, but also his research into wood type uh, is the, the critical place where I intersect with him most, most directly. Um, as he was teaching in Minneapolis, he was using uh, wood type uh, as a teaching tool simply to move material around easily so that his students could understand uh, uh, figure ground relationships with typographic form. And his students started asking questions, questions he couldn't answer um, and decided to look for the book uh, that had the answers and couldn't find the book. Uh, so with that started his process of, in of investigating um, uh, here's the blah, uh, started investigating wood type. And that took him on about a 10 year process of researching this portion of American uh, visual culture uh, that culminated in 1969 with the publication of his book, American Wood Type, 1828 to 1900. Um, at that point, it was the, and it remains in a lot of ways, uh, the primary text for understanding uh, vernacular printing in the 19th century. Uh, it has it has really not been topped in terms of the historical narrative that he was able to develop um, and look at uh, the impact of wood type on uh, American visual culture, but certainly uh, global uh, global culture as well. Um, this book tends to look uh, at the American or North American context. Um, this book was reprinted in 1977 as a paperback. Um, and between the two of those, uh, it was it was just a reprint. Um, it wasn't a, a new edition. Um, these are this tends to be the copy that you can find out in the world today. It's hard to get your hands on a, a hardbound copy. Um, but he also, after uh, looking at wood type um, in kind of feeling that he was finished by about the mid 1970s, taking a break from teaching for a few years and then entering again uh, into academia. Uh, the thing that he started researching next was trivets and stands, uh, which are basically pieces of metal that are used in the kitchen to put hot things on. Um, and in some ways, I think this is his masterpiece. All of the work that he figured out um, in terms of research methods, um, in terms of narrative structure, and in terms of uh, visual continuity um, inside a collection, was worked out in the wood type book and is is kind of brought to bear um, in his trivets and stands. Um, he amassed a fairly large collection of this material that is now uh, at the Arizona Historical Museum. Um, but that's not why we're here today. Um, we're here to talk about his typographic work. Um, the, one of the last pieces that he did was consult with Adobe uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. They were releasing digital versions of a lot of the wood type uh, that, that I'll be showing in this presentation. Um, and he was brought on as a consultant as the, the primary historian for that period. And so was able to help guide those designers on some of the most important uh, typeface designs from from that period, um, and it's really kind of the last the last hurrah of his of his wood type research. So his collection um, during the time that he started investigating wood type uh, first with his students and then on his own while he was in Minneapolis, um, he also began collecting wood type and. Primarily, originally, he was collecting it for his students' use in the classroom. Uh, collecting used wood type was really cheap. It fit in well with his academic budget. Uh, and it was something that he could bring into the classroom that students could use in a hands-on way uh, to begin to understand the design principles that he was teaching. Um, in over about a 10-year period, he amassed a fairly sizable collection. Um, in 1964, he moves to Kansas City. And I think that move, uh, it, it didn't break him, but it certainly uh, alerted him to how large his collection was. And he began looking for ways uh, to um, 
not get rid of his collection, but to move it to a safe place, uh, most likely held by a museum or a library. Uh, he had a number of connections um, around the country with librarians and archivists that he'd been working with during his research. And he began reaching out to them, first to the Newberry Library in Chicago, um, and asking, uh, asking if they were interested in it. They didn't have the room and pointed him in some other directions. Um, he had been a long friend of Dr. Bernard Keppel, who was the head librarian at the Museum of Modern Art at the time. And through his conversations with uh, Carpel, he was able to sell his collection in the mid 1960s uh, to Dr. Carpel, who then sold it to the University of Texas at Austin because of his connections to the Harry Ransom Center, the Humanities Research Center there on campus uh, in Texas. Um, the story I've always gotten is why it happened is, well, it was the mid 60s and there was a lot of oil money, so they could afford it. Um, and that's how it ended up at the HRC. Uh, it stayed at the HRC until the mid 90s when they were looking to deaccession it. Uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Gloria Lee, had was a new professor on campus at that point, heard about this move to deaccession the collection, realized the importance of that group, that set of materials, um, and was able to make sure that that collection, rather than leaving campus, came over uh, to the arts program. She was a design professor um, new to the arts program then. So the collection moved over uh, in the in late 96 uh, and stayed as a study collection by the design program in the School of the Arts. Uh, it is still there today. Um, I'm getting ready to go back and visit next week. Um, uh, and is used as a study collection by students. I think it's really critical to understand this uh, is material that is um, 100 years old. Uh, it is material that was used in the 19th century, used by printers to make things in the 19th and early 20th century. These are things that Kelly collected, um, uh, amassed a collection of about 150 to 160 uh, different uh, families of type forms um, and uh, visual material, illustrations and uh, borders. Um, and it is a working collection so students can actually get their hands on it. I think that's critically important. It is a tool to be used um, and it remains used to this day uh, rather than simply being a museum piece uh, that's seen under glass. It's, it's actually a, a continues to be a, a functioning tool. So in the collection uh, uh, in Austin, um, I, I came to campus uh, in 2004, um, and I was there until 2012 when I uh, then came to VCU. But during that time, I uh, worked uh, directly with the collection to help organize it at that point. Um, there hadn't been a lot of work um, since it had come over from the HRC in 96. Um, and so beginning to organize it and start my own uh, trajectory of research into this collection. So it is organized now in a series of archival boxes, uh, easily viewable um, as a collection um, in, uh, in, the pre in, the, in the press room. Um, anybody that comes into the press room can see uh, the organization uh, and it's organized stylistically. I'll talk a little bit about how that shows up in the book. Um, here's some images from the wood type in the collection. I can hear your oohs and ahs. Right, so enough about art, right? There's a, there's the 19th and 20th century visual culture. There is Rob Roy Kelly, there's his collection. Um, and here's the, the book, um, which is to say enough about that. How about me? So the book, uh, uh, I started research while I was uh, taking care of the collection um, in Austin. So this in some ways is a research trajectory that, that took about 15 years. Um, who's counting, um, when uh, when the final work uh, the, to bring it into a physical form and, and make a book uh, started um, in uh, about uh, 2018, um, and then it was finally published in 2022. So you, you can do the math. Uh, the great thing was, is being a designer, um, I also had the opportunity to design the book. So research, write the manuscript, um, work as a creative director uh, to manage all the photography and then also to um, design the book itself as, as a physical object in the world, um, which was 
you never get that opportunity. So it's been a, a lovely chance uh, for me to organize this material. Uh, the book itself is organized into a few different sections. Um, one about Kelly. Uh, I asked a, a few other scholars to write essays, uh, both about the impact of Kelly's work um, and about Kelly as a practitioner um, himself. Um, there is a, a, then a focus on the materials, the production timeline in the 19th century, the manufacturers, some of the research tools that I developed to investigate this collection, uh, classification system on how to visually organize the material. And then the bulk of the book is um, all of the material in the collection um, shown and put into a historical context. Um, and in some ways, I, I sort of see this book as both an overview of Kelly and his collecting, but also a deep and close reading of the collection itself. So um, unpacking it, looking at it as physical materials in the world that human beings made and continue to use uh, as tools for visual communication, uh, but also uh, sort of organized within an archival setting uh, that can still be accessed and used by visitors and, and by students. So that's the structure of the book. Um, in general, it's organized uh, visually. Um, here's some slides from the, the book itself. Um, as the designer, I also got to play around. Um, not almost get fired, but certainly got some questions asked uh, in, in developing the front end essays. Uh, it was just black text on white paper. And uh, I was working with uh, a fair amount of footnotes. Uh, UT Press had hoped that I would do end notes. I was really hoping for side notes. We worked that out. And then I did a crazy thing of taking six point type and doing uh, basically a gradient rainbow roll on the type. So six point type, which you don't, you shouldn't do this. Um, gradients from one color to another um, on the on the page. It's a little hard to see, but sort of these little rainbows um, all the way through. They thought I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I was really hoping it would work uh, and prove me right. Um, it did, it worked great. Um, it worked out. Um, looking at uh, kind of organizing the visual structure of the archive into a series of uh, styles, working with a classification system that allowed uh, sort of a better understanding of where to put materials and keep them organized. And then the main uh, specimen section of the book itself, uh, each spread shows some component of uh, each type in the collection. So it provides a, a history of that particular design, um, who the first manufacturer was when it was first released, when it was first published. There's also uh, each spread, each typeface has a comparison for uh, charting when the other manufacturers uh, in North America were also picking up this design. So in some ways that serves as a tool to see how prevalent any particular design was and also how quickly it was picked up. Um, pirating, uh, which we tend to think of, at least in a, in a typeface context, as a purely digital uh, uh, phenomenon um, and something that has been looked at really closely by uh, type makers since the advent of the uh, the kind of digital production of type was something that was easily done in the 19th century. You would simply order a manufacturer's full typeface. Um, you would bring it into your shop and then using the router, uh, the router and a pantograph mechanism to copy, uh, you could use your competitor's finished type to build your own patterns to then make your own stuff. Um, and there was really no, uh, no enforceable uh, copyright. Um, there were design copyrights, but they, they were, uh, it was uh, not in a wink. Um, so pirating was rampant and being able to compare uh, other manufacturers were able to map that um, across the industry to see um, who was borrowing from whom, um, who was originating uh, designs um, and how quickly they were kind of propagating through the through the network. Here is a two color uh, design. Um, two pieces of type uh, cut to the same block size were printed, uh, were overprinted on each other to provide uh, an opportunity to make three colors. Um, so it was uh, before color lithography really kind of took over completely um, in by the 20th century. Um, this was the way that wood type manufacturers were competing against that, uh, that color work by making chromatic types. Here's another chromatic type. Uh, they're fairly hard to find in the world. So um, 
the fact that Kelly has two of them in his collection was was pretty amazing um, and mostly complete set. You'll see here in this example, uh, it's missing the second color of the Q and the Z, uh, but showing that to sort of uh, be able to understand the the actual makeup of the of those sets. Um, other material. Um, right. Uh, there were some typefaces in his original book uh, that he borrowed from other uh, collections. Um, and so I've demarcated that in the book by not showing any of the wood type blocks since I didn't have direct access to them, but showing how they were produced in his book. So this particular face um, had uh, been it had been borrowed from a friend of his, um, printed for the specimen uh, in his book, um, but actually didn't ever hold the blocks and they weren't ever part of the Kelly collection. So trying to show that difference um, throughout the book as well. Um, and then also trying to be very uh, honest about the condition of the collection, rather than thinking of this as something that was perfect um, and uh, in uh, kind of pristine condition, um, it is used, it's a functioning tool. So in this instance, showing the Z that had been split, um, which is normal wear and tear on type, it's easy to, to fix and continue working, um, but uh, making sure that that was also illuminated in the book as well, um, so that the, that the narrative or the historical retelling of this collection didn't gloss over the reality of the collection as it exists um, as, a, as a study collection. I thought that was really important um, to, to make sure to, to capture in the book. Uh, there's a lot of uh, border material um, that was included as well. It was a portion of his collection that he did not write about in his book in 1969. So it was uh, in some ways un unpublished material at this point, um, but all, all of the material received the same treatment as the typefaces who first originated it when it was first published, who the other manufacturers were that made this and what did they call that material? Um, again, so that we can see that propagation of those designs throughout the throughout that network. Um, also looking at one of the publications that he did before the 1969 publication was a folio that he produced originally simply as a set of specimens that he could help organize his own collection, then became uh, a folio set, uh, 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 limited edition um, that he sold in 1964. There were 45 sets uh, produced. Um, uh, they were uh, mostly sold uh, through a shop in uh, New York. Um, and I've tried to figure out where those 45 copies are. We know where 32 of them are um, using different uh, tools, WorldCat being one of them, um, just sort of figuring out who, who has what. Um, copy cataloging, cataloging, which is a, a great benefit to librarians, um, is the bane of special collections because uh, many, uh, when you're copy cataloging, you're just copying someone else's catalog material um, and it doesn't necessarily show the exact number uh, or the edition number. So I've worked to uncover uh, 32 uh, of those folios, um, working on, on the rest of them to try to figure out where they all are. Um, and then also in taking a close look um, at the collection, looking at not only uh, the face of the block, the 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 action spot, uh, the typeface uh, as it's printed, but also just the marks of use um, and sort of how these objects are marred over time. So here, um, uh, the back of a type, for some reason, a coin, uh, a silver dollar coin was placed on a press bed, the type was placed on top of it, um, run through the press, and an impression was made that's pretty legible uh, on the back. Um, so this uh, this is kind of the material that you find when you just turn the blocks over. Um, and also there's any number of little bits and pieces that Kelly collected um, in, in his time trying to put together full sets. And so in a, in a print shop, the box that has all of the mismatched parts are called a hell box. Um, because it's hell to go through and find the bits. And there are two hell boxes in the Kelly collection from the materials that he original uh, brought in, uh, was sold with the collection in 66. And so here's a, here's a shot of one of the hell boxes. I don't know what the, I guess the plural of hell box is hell boxes. Um, not sure the etymology. So uh, here's a quick pandering to the business market. It's a 408 page book seven pounds, which 
is so affordable at 58 cents an ounce or about 15 cents a page. So holidays are coming up. So uh, as I as the book is now out in the world um, and beginning to uh, see people using the book, um, social media is a great place to see uh, how the book lives on people's shelves and, and how they use it in their shops. Um, I've begun really thinking about this book uh, as a, a toolkit. Um, as a series, uh, I used particular research methodologies, some that I borrowed, some that I just sort of figured up and made out, made as I, I went along. Um, and they they seem to be of good use uh, to find information when looking at a collection like this. Um, and so I tend to talk about this book now as a series of tools that other people with collections um, anywhere can use uh, to put into practice to figure out what they have. Um, I find that uh, there is correspondence between folks that have collections. They always think that their material is the oldest version possible. So they're very excited that they have old. And it somehow to me is uh, uh, any talk of reincarnation, you're always reincarnated from someone famous, um, which is great. Uh, but there's all the unfamous people that you could be reincarnated from too. And that's also awesome. And so hopefully these tools allow people to see that while they may not have um, uh, the historical pinnacle of any particular uh, item, that all of it is important. And all of it is important to understand that it was a tool that was used uh, to promote uh, visual culture, uh, that was circulated through networks, that human beings had their hands on and made decisions in making these, um, and that they had a physical presence in the world. So I think that is critically important. Um, and using these tools as a way to investigate and interrogate any collection, I think is the, the next step uh, that I hope, I hope to begin to see kind of the fruits of that uh, work. So um, I'll take you through a couple of tools uh, that, that I looked at. Um, one of them is because uh, it is wood, um, it is a natural, uh, naturally occurring uh, item. These are harvested um, and uh, sort of prepared. Uh, they have to be dried out when a tree is chopped down. It needs to be uh, dried out uh, over a period of time and then prepared so that it can be carved. Um, and in the manufacturing process, in the process of preparing raw lumber uh, to begin to be used as a piece of, to become a piece of wood type, um, certain tools were used um, to prepare that. And one of them was a planing saw uh, to plane down a chunk of wood so that it was type high, so that it would be the right height when you put it on a press to hit the roller um, and take the ink. And that's a that's a fairly intricate measurement. Um, most countries have different measures. In the United States, by about the, the end of the 19th century, it was 0.918 inches. Um, there's a little bit of flexibility there. But to get that, you have to use a metal saw to slice uh, the back of or the foot of a block. And here is a print of the, the other side. There's the face that prints and shows the typeface. On the other side of the block is the foot or the part that sits on the press bed. Um, and here you'll see two different uh, uh, kind of markations. One is the tree ring, the that blue concentric circle. Um, so you can see that it is a natural product, product. And then the other set of banding is actually the remnants of the circular saw uh, that was used to plane this material down to bring it to type high. And so beginning to recognize this and starting to, to think about uh, all of those types of tools in the 19th century were all custom built. And so custom built tools tend to leave custom traces. And so uh, beginning to then, um, I, I spent one summer printing the entire collection with students uh, on the faces. And then we spent another summer printing all of the, the feet uh, to get that pattern. And from that, comparing and contrasting, narrowing down a set of patterns that corresponded to manufacturers. So a way, one way to tell who manufactured this material, not just by the design on the face, but is the pattern of their tool on the foot. Um, so it's uh, sort of looking closely at the physical material uh, to uh, uncover its origins. And so here's a, a small set uh, to sort of uh, differentiate the different manufacturers. Um, another tool um, is the stamp in the side of a block. Um, oftentimes with metal type, uh, when it's produced, there is a, a, a pin uh, that is pressed into the side of 
the body of the metal and it marks the manufacturer. So any piece of metal type has a manufacturer's mark. Wood type didn't follow the same process. Only for some reason in North America, the capital A's were stamped with the manufacturing company. And then uh, only when they were directly selling the type, their networks of uh, licensees and sort of indirect selling wasn't wasn't marked. So we're left with uh, uh, a bit of a piecemeal and figuring out who manufactured. So between the manufacturer's stamp um, and looking at the, the foot pattern or the saw pattern on the foot of the block, those are two methods uh, that can help us pretty definitively narrow down the, the manufacturer of that particular face. So here's an instance where William H. Page of Greenville, uh, Connecticut, stamped the side of his type um, from the research I've done, we know that the, this particular stamp was used between 1859 and 1867 because of the location and because of the name configuration, and also because of looking at the print, the sales catalogs that those manufacturers produced. Um, we can see, uh, we can sort of triangulate and begin to understand uh, when when these stamps were used. So the book uh, looks at all of the stamps that were in the collection um, and proposes uh, a way of annotating uh, those marks so that uh, using a bibliographic tool, um, developing a process so that people can check their collection and see what stamp configuration they have and begin to understand when their type might have actually been made. Um, and this is a tool also that's by sharing this uh, with the community, have already come up with two or three stamps that had been undiscovered before, just because either people didn't understand that they were important or didn't realize they hadn't been discovered. So slowly as this conversation kind of expands through uh, folks that have collections today, hopefully we'll, we'll begin to increase the understanding of the manufacturers during that time. Um, another cool is uh, another tool, cool tool, uh, is the timeline, a visual timeline. I tend to be a visual person, um, and reading uh, historical uh, an account um, is hard for me to keep the dates and the places uh, together. And so, developed a visual timeline to sort of show the major manufacturers, um, and also uh, the little green lines there are the circulation of laborers, people that would leave one shop and go to another, and often take designs with them. And so we can begin to trace uh, the, the again, that propagation through the network of how styles uh, were shared um, across, uh, across the industry. Um, another tool was looking at the, the visual makeup uh, of the styles um, in the collection. Um, and beginning to organize those into a set of ways to define the characteristics. So developing a nomenclature uh, to describe the visual uh, style that, that is in front of you when you're looking at a, at a typeface um, and beginning to understand um, how to organize that in a way that we understand what, uh, what, what styles they belong to. And so developing uh, this Roman antiques, uh, Romans uh, tend to be serif faces, uh, book faces uh, that you're used to reading uh, in, a, in a book, um, those little serifs. Uh, antiques are slab serifs, so um, much uh, sort of heavier uh, visually dominant forms um, that were developed in the 19th century. And then Gothics, which are just sans serifs. Um, types without the serif. And so looking at that as an organizing structure, mapping what styles are in the collection, um, looking at that matrix, beginning to see what's not available in the collection, but also beginning to think of this matrix um, in, in coming to a, a completeness of describing all visual components of the type that was developed in the 19th century, you have basically a generative model where you can mix and match any particular component and build new typefaces also. Um, so uh, th this, this was interesting to me as a maker um, using historical research as a way to sort of drive contemporary practice um, is, is interesting. So I think of this as not only a mapping of what, uh, what is in the collection, a mapping of what's not in the collection, but also a generative, uh, the capacity for a generative tool to make new type as well. Um, another bit of work was uh, unpacking the type and looking closely at the type, um, unpacking typefaces that we could find. Um, in working with uh, students in printing the types, um, 
answering questions. Um, I felt very much like Rob Roy Kelly at that point, uh, kind of like, oh, we need to go find the book. Oh, how do we answer that? Um, they were printing this particular face, uh, which was uh, what I'm showing on the screen is a page from Kelly's book, uh, page 257, uh, of Clarendon number one. Now, I think NEI, this was produced in 1969. Uh, it was very available. People were looking at this very closely. And it wasn't until 2006 that two students were like, hey, there's a problem here. Uh, and then we began to look closer. So this looks like it's one design, but in fact, it, it isn't. Um, it's, a, it's two designs. Uh, and what we did is we printed everything in the collect, all the types uh, that were included under that name, uh, and then began looking for uh, similarities and differences, and then overlapping those uh, digitally to begin to compare and contrast. And so here you can see uh, overlapping a red type and a, red and a blue type, um, we can see the difference. Um, and that isn't just a manufacturing artifact, those are actually two different, uh, it's two different manufacturers um, approaching this particular design, very similar, but different enough to be uh, two separate faces. And so in unpacking the type, realize that there's two, uh, two complete sets, um, one that was manufactured by William Page, the other that had no imprint, but is very likely uh, produced by Hamilton uh, Manufacturing, which is based in Wisconsin. And so suddenly uh, kind of a thing that was in front of all of us for decades, uh, looking closely, you can begin to unpack and see um, and see components. So uh, I will end with some work that drives me from all of this, um, rather than being done, uh, kind of really seeing this as just just the beginning. Um, so I included in the book um, a short bibliography of specimen catalogs. Um, manufacturers that would make this type would sell the type and they would produce uh, small specimen catalogs with samples that they would send out to printers um, and uh, shops to purchase. You would uh, look at any sales catalog and pick the type, say the size, place your order, get your type. Um, and so there is a, a fairly interesting um, collection of these materials at uh, libraries and archives around the country. Um, again, not something that was fully looked at in terms of the, the material of print culture um, until the mid 20th century. Um, certainly this slice of it, it was uh, seen as job printing was not worthy of um, the, the nobility of beautiful type. Um, and so Kelly really changed that um, and sort of by historicizing that particular moment, a lot of people started taking a look at their collections. Um, and so there's, uh, there's a wealth of material. I've been cataloging that bibliographically and so the work is to find exhaustively all the collections around the country that have this material from the 19th and the 20th century. <laughs> Looking at this material that has been digitized, there's dis, uh, different digitizing uh, projects in different collections that don't all seem to be talking to each other. So I've been working with the Letterform Archive uh, out in California to begin to track these down. They've got a larger project of all typographic materials. Um, and I've been looking at just the wood type catalogs. And so building a list um, and trying to repatriate that, uh, unify that list uh, digitally so that you can uh, have one place where you can find all of this digital material. Um, another work is taking all those sales catalogs and then indexing them to understand all of the material that is shown, the size, all the typefaces, all the sizes and all the, the letter forms. Um, they never showed a full set because they didn't want uh, competitors ripping them off right out of the sales catalog, at least by our type before you're gonna copy us. And so compiling this to begin to get a sense of what's available uh, from uh, primary materials. Um, also looking at the design patent record. Um, I've been working with students um, in a research practicum to look through uh, all of the, uh, of the patent record, the US design patent record from the 19th century. We're now starting on the 20th century and uh, finding um, all of the typographic patents that were available. And then also uh, looking at all the actual laborers that were doing this work. Excuse me. Um, it's hard to track uh, 
folks down uh, that were doing the work. Uh, the narrative has typically been the company owner, um, that they were sort of the heroic singular that did all of the work. But in fact, it was a corporation. So there were all the all the people on the shop floor that were doing the actual work, coming up with the actual designs. Um, I'm almost done. I'm mindful of the time. Uh, but looking at uh, beginning to um, look at records um, from um, historical societies in the centers where these manufacturers were working, what I've shown on the screen is uh, William Page was a manufacturer that was based in Connecticut in uh, for the, the entire duration uh, of his manufacturing career, so about 30 years. Um, because it was the East Coast, there were really great records kept. So between um, uh, directories um, that were published annually uh, that showed everybody in town and their who their employer was and where they were living, and what their job title was, uh, to um, sales records of uh, who who was buying what property, beginning to trace them through that census records um, that were both at the state level and the at the national level um, to sort of compare and contrast those names. Um, I've been able to uh, compile about 150 uh, employees of the Page Company over the time that they were working from about 1860 until about 1890. And one of the really interesting components of this is beginning to realize that Page in particular had a fairly large uh, labor force, uh, female labor force, um, working in his shops, certainly through the Civil War and from 1860 to 1865, but then even after uh, keeping them on. And they were a, a major portion of the, the labor force at all components from designers to type cutters uh, to printers. He had a print shop um, to, to produce his own materials. Um, and so beginning to see all of the, the division of labor that was going on has been really interesting. Um, using Page as an example, because uh, he is a company, his company didn't move and and it was in a location that really kept great civic records, um, trying to replicate this uh, in other, uh, New York was another center um, of production. And so beginning to look at all those manufacturers. And while we tend to anonymize all of the 19th century as it's just a decorative face from the 19th century that somehow just magically came up through the culture, there were real human beings that made decisions in the same way that today a type designer makes a decision about uh, a, the visual presentation of a face and markets that. Finding uh, finding all these folks um, is a is a major uh, component. So that is where I will end. Um, shout out to uh, gross uh, self promotion. I keep a website uh, uh, very slow. If you'll notice the most recent date on my. Uh, <clears throat> slow blog uh, of uh, research um, as I collect it um, as a way to sort of circulate these ideas um, with uh, folks that I know that are that are working um, here also. Um, and then also uh, social media as a really great way to promote the work um, and get uh, get quicker conversations going uh, with people that are uh, that have used the book um, or uh, find a typeface in their collection that they don't know about. Um, it's a it's a great way to produce um, a conversation. Um, shout out to all the librarians and archivists that I have relied on heavily and could not do the work that I do without their dedication um, and their uh, protection of these materials. So uh, certainly a, a partial list, but these folks have been great. Um, and I continue to rely on them heavily. Um, and then again, credit where credit's due. I used all of these typefaces in this particular presentation. These are human beings that made these designs, so they get the shout out as well. Um, these are all available digitally and really fun to play with. And I rely on them to make this stuff look uh, presentable. Um, and finally, thank you for being here and listening. Um, Christina, again, thank you for uh, making, uh, providing this opportunity to, to speak to uh, everybody at VCU. This is great. So. I will. Oh, I'm done. Time. And I made it. Oh, perfect. We're doing great on time. And we have about 10 minutes for questions and discussion. So I just wanted to say uh, what a what a great job to list all the contributors and to thank everyone in such a way. Um, I haven't seen this in a long time. So <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. And, and uh, you know, if, Printing a book, publishing a book is is a huge endeavor. But in this case, with with this 
particular book. Uh, it's it's really a collective effort. So I think you've you've conveyed that. Um, Thanks. Before the questions uh, start rolling in, if they do, <laughs> I know we have some book historians here. My colleague Josh Eckhart is still here. Um, I see uh, Jimmy Gaffrey, right, is probably still here. Um, I, I wanted to go back to what you said about side notes, because I didn't know you could actually fight publishers on <laughs> the kind of you know footnotes and notes side notes and um and I, I also appreciated the visual timeline right so um I, I'd like us you to to talk to us a, a little bit about you know putting this book together working with the press what does it mean to publish a book like this you know this seven pound book of of goodness which um I think is one of your reviewers is saying that um, you know, the book sets a new typographic history bar, right? This 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 book is is a classic in the making, right? And on all, I think you've convinced us of all the labor that has gone into this. <laughs> but but can you talk to us a little bit about that process and also printing a book like this, right? And and the, the entire process that goes into actually holding this book. Yeah, it's and and I think that was the the most surreal of this entire process is so much of this research has been in my head or on bits of paper or uh, was only ever kind of evident in individual conversations with archivists or librarians. And so to actually put it all together and then have it be out in the world and then to have this thing show up on my doorstep, I got an advanced copy from the publisher and it was like, oh my God, it's seven pounds. Like, and I'm a designer. Like I should have known like, oh, you put enough paper, it's going to weigh something. And it was just so lost on me. Like I made a seven pound thing in the world. <laughs> it was, um, I I know uh, half the population does that all the time, but I, uh, I it was, it was amazing. Um, I think to, to think of all the, all of the labor that went into this, of all the different uh, folks um, at UT Press and how supportive they were of this. I think um, really the reason this happened is when I was still on campus, um, I had started to have conversations with, uh, at the time, the director, uh, Dave Hamrick. Um, and he uh, kind of wanted to expand what UT Press was doing. And he saw this, uh, he was excited by the collection and he was excited by the possibility that a book about the collection could kind of move them in a new direction. Um, he was amazing throughout the process and had said like, uh, books take time. They, once you start these things, they have a life of their own. So I promptly left Texas uh, after he and I had that conversation, moved here, um, and then started my work as chair. And so like a lot of that research stopped. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Sasha Waters, uh, did some work in Austin, and she came back in about 2018. She was like, oh, hey, I saw Dave Hamrick. He says hi and wonders when you're going to call him. It's like, holy crap, Dave. Like Dave has kept this. So I, I reached out and he said, yeah, I still have the folder. I said it was going to take its own time. I knew you'd be back. Um, and so I really, that kind of, um, I think I, I am well aware that that is completely unusual uh, to be able to have an advocate uh, at that level um, really want this book to be made. Um, he knew that also I was a designer. And so I was able to ask him to be able to do the design as well. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, beyond the fact that I did that part for free, so what they saved whatever labor costs there, um, I think they were kind of singularly unprepared for my proposal when it came back. And they, uh, luckily that, that team was really responsive and was like, okay, this is going to be one of our high-end books um, uh, for that year's publication. They tend not to put this kind of work in into producing it. And so I think just all along the way, I was I was unbelievably lucky to have uh, that kind of support. Um, and I don't think this book could have been produced um, in some ways at any other time. I did a lot of this work during uh, the, the lockdown. And so <laughs> there, was, there was an immense amount of focus that I don't think I would have necessarily brought to it. Um, but I will say uh, from to make this even more long-winded, um, from from feedback that I've gotten from folks that seem genuinely appreciative of the of the work, and I I, I really take that to heart. That's amazing to have a thing out in the world where where people respond in that way. But I think for me, I this was just an amalgamation of all of the great things 
that I saw that my colleagues were doing, how, how to reproduce a piece of type, how to uh, dive in um, unapologetically into the history of a thing and talk about it and not be worried about um, how other people are going to read it, but just being like, this is, this is an object that needs to be talked about and I need to talk about it as exhaustively as I can to put it into this moment uh, so that it can be saved for other people. And so, um, I, again, I blame everybody else uh, that I've been looking at for for this work. Um, it's I, I couldn't have done this without them in that way. Like I, I couldn't have just come up with this on my own. Um, uh, this is a an answer to a lot of those uh, a lot of their research work. So absolutely, um, there were some questions, but but most of them are not questions. Most of them are beautiful book, amazing research. There was a Q and A post from. Uh, an anonymous uh, participant who had to leave er early, fascinating. Uh, since we occasionally have students who come back to the recordings or sometimes are here with us, how do you see your, your book uh, training the next uh, generation of, of graphic designers and, and scholars and uh, maybe art historians? Um, I think I think more about historians. And I think I've started, I've, um, I think in the fact that I've seen folks begin to approach their own collections um, using some of these tools. Um, uh, a printer that I know on the West Coast uh, that has a, a fairly um, unexciting collection, uh, you know, to be perfectly honest, a lot of sort of sans serif faces from the 20th century. Um, she kind of took a tart to be like, oh, all collections are important. I'm going to approach this as well, and was able to map out uh, what what she has in that collections. It's it's tied to a particular press on the West Coast, um, and I think has done uh, hasn't published anything yet. Um, has has presented this work at a few conferences, um, but I've been really excited by the by the kind of embrace of the non historical um, importance of the collection, and still be able to write. A detailed uh, collect uh, a set of notes about that collection on where the material came from, um, tracing those networks of uh, sort of smaller smaller networks of who sold this, who was who was selling this material in the late 1960s on the West Coast in America, um, how they arrived at that particular collection, and sort of the the variation um, in some of those forms. Um, and I, I think that's the kind of work that's it's very small. Um, in, in some ways, but I think really important when you begin to put put all of this together. And I hope that I hope that by providing the tools and talking about um, history not as uh, something that is uh, kind of behind us, um, it's it's all a construct, right? We all tell these stories to kind of build histories and tell uh, tell the the now. Um, that hopefully working with students, they understand that they're living in a historical moment, that the work that they're doing uh, is connected in the same way that these people in the 19th century were. The, these people in the 19th century didn't think they were historically important. They were just making stuff. They were making decisions as human beings. And so trying to have, uh, hopefully imparting on uh, students in a particular way, like they are just as important and just as uh, kind of, just as uh, they're uh, living in banality um, as, as all of these folks were in the 19th century that end up in a big seven pound book. So um, I think that was a long way around that question. Sorry. Yeah, wonderful. No, no, this is great. And Carla May, I'm sorry, apparently I can't type anymore, but I just wanted to respond to your question that our recording of, of David's presentation will be made available on our website in the next couple of weeks. Our uh, communications assistant is, is out next week. So um, we'll, we'll make sure it gets to you. Um, before we uh, go today, David, I, I have one last question for you. Um, you, you make this claim um, throughout the book that the history of America was printed in wood type. And I wanted if you could leave us with, with you know, sort of a longer meditation on this, not just for art historians, but also for literary historians, for humanists who, who you know, work with these materials in different methods, but for, for similar goals, I think, scholarly goals. Um, yeah. Wow, this is where I, I want to like lose the connection, like, what? I can't hear you. I... <laughs> That's a that's a heavy thing. I mean, I um yeah, yes. Um, I mean, I I think um not to be hyperbolic, but um the reason we have a five day work week is because of typographic unions, because of that visual culture that I showed in the nineteenth century. Um, so many people were working on it, so many people were organized. Um, that's why we get to to have five day work week. Um, 
spot onto the UAW for a four day work week. I'm totally behind them. Um, but I think understanding that like the, the visual material we often think of as just um, visual material, right? Like, oh, it's pretty to look at. Oh, there were things done. But I think understanding the, the ramifications and, and the mechanization, what that did to the to the work floor, what these tools did um, in terms of, I've read some great papers about um, uh, how it changed, how we moved our bodies um, through the manufacturer, how those tools uh, provided opportunities um, to, to make particular things, to make uh, the bulk of particular things and how those um, again, propagated through that network and how they became important. Um, the, it's interesting to sort of chart the the importance of this or sort of look at the printed record um, in archives from handbills to all sorts of publications and see the, the presence of anything bigger than about that uh, that's printed uh, in the 19th or early 20th century is very likely wood type, um, almost, almost definitely wood type. Um, and so understanding how it was uh, prevalent everywhere um, that that's a that's a tool that we can use then to date that material as well. That's another sort of loop in all of this to to sort of help archivists um, understand the 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 date of a particular uh, piece of material based on the typeface that was designed. It can narrow narrow things down, but also understanding that um, that uh, wood type does show up. Certainly, the the examples I showed of the twentieth century. Um, were more important, right? The the sanitation workers strike that was wood type. Um, Dewey wins that was wood type. Uh, that is not to say that uh, it was more important than the or more serious in the twentieth century than it was in the nineteenth. Um, but I think it just shows that it kept kept being used because it was a low cost tool to produce um, and distribute messages quickly in ways that were pre-digital, um, sort of how, how they did things before digital. And I think they remain important today to circumvent digital networks. I think that printing physically and propagating uh, physically out into the world remains important um, so that it can be saved in archives, so that it can be, uh, so it shows up on the street, um, that it shows up in our lives on a regular basis and not just on a screen. 